Hello, my name is Francis Pinder, and you are watching or listening, perhaps, to the Salesforce Posse podcast, where I speak to Salesforce industry influencers so that we can gain a better understanding of how to excel in a career path from a Salesforce admin and developer to an architect. And thank you so much for listening, because this podcast is now a top 10 most watched podcast on Spotify. So thanks a lot. But before I get talking to my next fantastic guest, I wanted to let you know about a new site I've launched on the interweb. Now, if I have one goal, it's to improve the way that we create Salesforce solutions for the benefit and improve those outcomes for organizations as a whole to maximize their value of Salesforce. And one of the biggest mistakes I see that people make as a Salesforce architect is really that they think it's all about the tech, but it's really not. In fact, my opinion is tech is only one part of the puzzle because really without having like the business acumen to understand how you're aligning your solution to the organization's goals or vision, uh, it just is important as other uh, areas as well. So I've created the Salesforce Architect Scorecard where you can measure yourself against what I believe an awesome architect really is. I provide you with personalized advice on five key areas. So. If you are an aspiring architect or even a Salesforce admin or developer wondering how you score, then maybe you'll be surprised at the results. It's totally free and you just need to head to salesforceposse.com slash scorecard. So one of the key areas I kind of measure uh, people on is how you convince stakeholders in a confident way and really understand the audience you're presenting to. So I gave a call to the guru of presentations uh, and presentation technique, Andrea Hassini, and he is head of Ideas On Stage UK. Ideas On Stage has worked with thousands of clients around the world, including companies like Microsoft, Lacoste, the World Bank, and a staggering over 500 TEDx speakers. Andrea is on a mission to stop great ideas from falling just because of the way they are presented. So if you're interested in learning how to become a confident presenter, how to really communicate your ideas in a meaningful way to get buy-in, as well as some amazing top tips on how to improve if you're nervous at presenting in public, as well as the future of public speaking in this kind of digital AI world, I think you're going to get a lot of value out of this conversation with Andrea. So without further ado, Let's go. Hi, Andrea. How are you? And welcome to the Salesforce Posse podcast. Thank you, Frances. I'm very good. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, you are you know, the go-to person for you know communication presentations and things like that, in my mind, anyway. But can you kind of talk a bit about your background and how you became so passionate about helping people become better presenters? Sure. I think I'm the go-to person just on your mind. But but that's but th 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 right. <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, yes, so a, a bit of background. Uh, I'm the, the head of Ideas on Stage UK. I'm a presentation coach. And the the reason why I'm so passionate about public speaking is because when I was a little kid growing up in Italy, I grew up in a family of very small business owners. My parents have always been running their own very small business together. They still do. And so as a kid, I saw the challenges because raising four kids, we were talking about it, Francis, before going live, you've got two, I've got one. Uh, with my parents, yeah. four. So <laughs> raising four kids while trying to run a business is not easy. But I also saw the spark, the entrepreneurial mindset, the proactive approach to life. And so that's why I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, to run my own thing. Now, in reality, there remained a dream for a long time because before doing what I'm doing now, I tried many things, started many projects, all of them failed. 
But it was useful because in that process, what I realized was that there are so many great ideas that fail, not because of the ideas themselves, but just because of the way they are presented. And that's why, to cut it short, over the years, I became a presentation coach. That's why my mission is to stop great ideas from failing just because of the way they are presented. My, my vision, Francis, is to help hundreds of thousands of business leaders inspire their audiences, increase their influence, and why not make a positive impact in the world? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I find this quite a lot like, in my Salesforce world. Of It's a very business-focused platform, right? And you're very close to the business, working with the business, trying to improve it and really kind of accelerate it. And I see so many people that kind of just fall down, just that they have these great ideas, great ways of improving the business or whatever, and they just can't deliver it in a way that convinces the people that they're talking to. Um, so... Uh, which, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so wh- what do you think about the, some of the key things that people do fail at, you know, when they're presenting and when they've got these ideas? The main thing is exactly what you've mentioned now, that whether we are aware of it or not, often we communicate a message which is either too complex or too technical or too detailed there. And that doesn't always work, depending on the audience. It always depends on the audience. And mm. the reason why that happens is because often, we, you know, if, if you think about, so we're talking about, like in my case, um, also maybe for your listeners, business owners or business leaders, experts who are very good at what they do, they know their yeah. business professionals, they know their their staff, they have experience, they have expertise, they are brilliant at Salesforce. But then you may be brilliant at Salesforce, but if you know, if you if you can't communicate what you do effectively, then it, it, it doesn't matter. And so that's why we often end up communicating a message which is either too complex, too technical, too detailed. We know so much about what we do. We are, we are also so close to it that we think that everything is important. And so we think that we need to communicate everything. But if everything yeah. is important, then nothing is important for the audience. I can give you an example, Francis, because this is the number one problem in, in communication, which I see all the time with my clients. But the, the, the best description of that problem I found comes from a fantastic book I read many years ago. I don't know if you know Made to Stick by the Heath Brothers which is, it's a fantastic, it's an international bestseller. It's a book about how to make your ideas stick in the minds of your audiences. And in that book, they talk about a Stanford University study known as Tappers and Listeners. In 1990, a psychology student asked two groups of people to play a game. One group, the Tappers, they had to tap out rhythms to famous songs on a table. So think about very famous songs like Happy Birthday to Use, songs like that. But instead of singing the songs, they just had to tap them out on a table, the rhythm, the tappers. And then the other group, the listeners, they just had to try and guess the songs. Now, before the experiment started, the student asked the tappers to estimate how many songs they thought the listeners would have guessed. Now, what do you think, Francis? On a scale from zero to 100%, how many songs do you think that the tappers thought the listeners would have guessed? Or over a pit while tapping them out yeah. and remembering them and then saying them at the end. Oh, I don't know. 10, 10 20. 20, okay. I don't so know. the yeah. tappers thought that the listeners would have guessed 50% of the songs. Now, in reality, what happened was very different. The listeners only guessed 2.5% of the songs. Why? Oh, wow. Why? Because if you are a tapper, you have knowledge that the listeners don't have. This is the number one Mm. problem in communication, the curse of knowledge. If you're a tapper, you have the songs mm. in your head. And so for you, it's obvious. And you find it very hard to yeah, understand yeah. why the listeners can't guess them. But if you are a listener, you don't have the songs in your head. You don't have the knowledge. And so for you, it's not obvious at all. And this is the key problem. Once we know something, like it was for the tappers, 
we find it very hard to imagine what it means not knowing what we know. And this is the biggest, yeah, the find, biggest problem yeah. we see. It's our and I, I found that actually, even with when I was doing, I, so I did, started e-learning training like years ago, and then people would start. I'd, I'd do the training, uh, or you know, record the videos, put them up there, and you get people asking questions like, you know, what is CRM and stuff like that. And I just assumed people would know it, right? <laughs> and then I suddenly, went, oh, actually no, okay, I'll have to put a video in that and tweak this and tweak that. Uh, and then you suddenly get this, yeah, you're kind of a unconsciously assuming it's his public knowledge right <laughs> and, and it's really not uh and yeah absolutely right yeah completely so never, yeah, never totally the agree. lesson one of the lessons for us is we should never assume that the audience knows something or understands something it could be an idea it could be a, an acronym as you mentioned crm just yeah. because we do so how do you do so um so how, but then you know you could go well actually this is so dumbed down right that actually i can't even get to my message that i want to give across so how how do you make sure and how do you kind of make sure you're kind of pitching and and, and convincing those people at the right level yeah. so it's not about that's a great point because it's not about dumbing it down it's not about making things simpler than what they should be. It's about finding and using language that everybody in your audience can understand. So it always depends hmm. on the context, on your audience. For example, if you are pitching, presenting to an audience who has a high level of knowledge and understanding of your subject, and if you are talking about something which is technical and the audience is also very technical, then that's a different case. Yeah. But in many situations, yeah. that's not that's not the case. So there are we can approach this from a message perspective in terms of how you develop your message, also from a delivery perspective. So if we think about your delivery, for example, then what great communicators do is they use language that a 15-year-old would understand. So we, we need to try to simplify a language. See, and simple, Francis, simple can be harder than complex. Because anyone yeah, can use, totally for example, yeah. long, confusing sentences. Anyone can use acronyms, jargon, industry-specific technology that we understand, as you said earlier, not necessarily the audience. And that's what a lot of people do. A lot of people in business mm. use complex language because they think that if they do that, then they sound smarter and more credible. Mm. The opposite is true. If you look at what great yeah, communicators I, do is yeah. they replace complex language with simple language. And again, because that's important, when I say that you need to speak simply, it's not about dumbing it down. It's about finding and using language that as many people as possible in your audience can understand. And actually, if I think about your audience, your listeners, your community, your sales force, administrators, architects, experts, that the more complex and the more technical your your subject, the more useful this becomes. Yeah, and I, I see it a lot. It's like one of the hardest things I've kind of learned is how do you, yeah, how do you present and how do you communicate a complex thing in a simple way? And so I'm always kind of striving to that one pager almost of in that one slide, that one way of just communicating that one message, which is yeah, really difficult, right? <laughs> oh, I found, you know, I found it really difficult. And especially when you've got all this baggage of complexity, oh, I could talk about this and this and this and oh yeah, but there's these, these assumptions you can make and you don't want to do those or, oh, actually these, these caveats and, and stuff like this, but they don't really need to know that, right? Uh, and, and how do you kind of present that and display that information in, in a way that is consumable to your and audience? Francis, we, we could do, we could approach this episode if you want, just on this, because there's so much to talk about here. And yeah. <laughs> after, for example, <laughs> from a from a message perspective, in terms of how you simplify your message, so it's a bit like writing. Now, if you think about writing, then all experienced writers know that the secret to great writing is not in what they say. It's in what they don't say. The more they remove, mm, okay. the better the book or the better the article, the better the report, the yeah. better the, the email. 
And the same is true with our presentations. So, uh, for example, we worked with a client some time ago. His name is Luc Breton from France. Luc used to be one of the executive vice presidents at Orange. And he always, great presenter. And he always liked to say, I only remember one thing from a presentation. Just tell me what I need to know. No more. One thing. So, for example, for you, Francis, for, for, your, for your community, for your listeners, think about your next presentation. How can you summarize the core idea behind that presentation in just one message? And how can you do that in just 70 words, 30 seconds? I can promise you, if you can do that, then you are you are simplifying your message if not most likely your message isn't simple enough and let me give you a practical tool that that we can that we can use we can try and summarize the core idea behind our next presentation following this format maximum 70 words and the format is this what so what what next so first of all we want to tell the audience the what what do they need to understand what do they need to remember what do they need to take away? And that's important, but it's not enough. Often, that's another mistake, by the way. We stay at this level. The audience doesn't know something. We tell them something. Okay, but it's not enough. Another key question <laughs> is, so what? Why should they care? Why is your message hmm. important and relevant to them, to your audience? And then, what next? Okay, now that the, now that they care... Now that they understand why this is important to them, what do you want them to do after your presentation? You may want to convince some stakeholders about something. You may want to mm. you you may want to get their buy-in. You may want to influence them. We we give presentations and we communicate in general because we often we want the audience to take action. Or at least at the very least, they need to think something new or different. They need to believe something new or different. Otherwise, we've wasted our time and even worse, we've wasted theirs. Yeah. And I think it was also like in the Salesforce world, you kind of get this, I, I, yeah, this kind of information parody where you're kind of giving all these options. Yeah. Because there's so many different ways to do the same thing. But then you see, well, but the person at the other end said, okay, so what do I, well, okay, you give me all this vision. So what's the action from that? Which is the best one? or not and they're kind of always leaving it up to them to decide it's like well no it's it's coming from you you've got to give them the, the carrot to say well this is the right approach to take and this is why and this is the action you need to make um uh, and as well as yeah death by powerpoint which i think is always a a, a classic one which i even find today like so in the salesforce world you've got these kind of certified technical architects which people think are you know the the pinnacle of a salesforce's career or somebody's career in salesforce world but i kind of see i've seen them where like they just can't communicate their powerpoint is just bullet points bullet points bullet points every single page is just pages of bullet points and you, the message gets lost you don't you, they can't see the the what the you know why do i need to do this and the action for it right uh, which is absolutely true and just kind of keeping it simple and yeah getting them to the convinced convince them that your approach is the best approach right for the business for the for the uh, for the customers at the end of the day because salesforce is a customer tool right um, and, yeah, and to yeah, do that, course, Francis, um, to do that, you're right, because you mentioned PowerPoint, I often see the typical death yeah. by PowerPoint. Now, if we want the audience to take action, if we want to deliver an effective presentation, we need to have a compelling message. That's the most important thing. Yeah. We need to be able to deliver the message effectively. So delivery, this is not what you say, this is how you say it. And then you mm. also need to pay attention to the visual element. Now, we don't have to use slides all the time. Often we do in business, and they can be powerful. They can be useful for you to get your message across even better, but often they act as a barrier between your message and, and the audience because of the typical death mm. by PowerPoint. You're right. When we've got slides yeah. full of text and details, bullet points, people – can't read and listen at the same time. Written text, this is demonstrative, mm. written text is processed in exactly the same part of the brain that processes spoken text. 
And so what that means is uh, right. that every time we show a slide full of text, for example, the audience will need to make a decision. Do I listen to Francis or do I read the slide? We can't do both things at the same time. Uh, it's a bit like yeah. if you go to a restaurant, uh, especially good restaurants, fancy restaurants, what they do is they mm. pay a lot of attention to the food, of course. That has to be great quality but they also pay a lot of attention to the way the food is presented. Even the most delicious dish must be properly plated. And presentation, the presentation affects the taste. It's a fact. When we are giving a presentation, it's the same thing. Our food is a message, and that's the most important thing. But then if you choose to illustrate your message visually then we need to do that effectively we need to keep our slides for example simple and visual we should never use them as something that replicates what we are saying which we should use them as a visual aid that supports reinforces and amplifies your message but as the presenter you are the presentation not your slides yeah i think and actually yeah i've I did actually a, a, a talk at the Salesforce World Tour, which is Salesforce's kind of big event in in, in London. And I literally, it's the first time I think I've pretty much really done it, was literally just one image, two two words, basically, pretty much on every slide. Uh, and everything was just me talking over the top of it. And it was quite amazing to see the reaction to it. And that, yeah, you don't have this kind of disconnect. And I think you're absolutely right. You kind of see it. They, they were a lot more engaged in what I was saying um, because I was speaking it and, and presenting it. But I think also for those that are listening, you know, there's, there's, you know, challenges in this whole kind of public speaking, standing up in front of people and actually saying this stuff and going, well, is it even right? Am I doing the right thing? So kind of how do you handle those people that have kind of got that resistance to kind of that public speaking and standing up in front of people? My my only well my, my main thought is if there's resistance, which often then leads to maybe fear or anxiety, nerves. So first of all, we need to understand that if we resist something and if we think about maybe public speaking anxiety, nerves, then everybody feels nervous. Everybody feels that kind of resistance. I'm a presentation coach, Francis. I give presentations all the time. Me and my colleagues, we help our clients do the same, but I always feel nervous before a presentation, always. It's natural. There's a quote attributed to Mark Twain, and most likely it's one of those quotes that, that he never said, especially when it comes to Mark Twain. But 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 the but the he makes a point, and the point the quote is: there are only two types of speakers: those who get nervous, and those who are liars. Uh, and I agree, I agree with him, <laughs> even if he never said that. I agree with yeah. him one hundred percent. And now, yeah. we the, the best way to overcome I wouldn't say overcome, but to address that in a positive way is to know what you're talking about. And the best way to know what you're talking about is to rehearse. For, we, we, again, we can talk about many other practical things that people can do, but one of the most important things that leads to so many benefits is the importance of rehearsing. And when I ask people, do you rehearse your presentations? They often say yes. The reality is that either they don't or they think yeah, they think yeah. they are rehearsing, through, yeah. but what they're doing is yeah. something else. Perhaps they are practicing. It's it's a different thing. Maybe what they do is. Mm. So what do you mean by practicing versus yeah? yeah. So practicing means that say for example that you've got some slides, so you open up your PowerPoint mm. in preparation for a presentation. It, it could have been your uh, your your conference, your your talk at the conference uh, in London that you gave some time ago. You look at your slides mm. and you think about what to say. So, okay, here I need to talk about this. Here I need to talk about that. And then as you do that, maybe you start repeating a little bit, but then, then you realize that something is not quite right. You need to change something. So you go back and change it. And that's mm. fine. That's a practice session, which is important, but it's not enough. Great presenters yeah. also rehearse in addition to practicing. And rehearsing means repeating your presentation out loud, not in your head, out loud, 
from the very beginning to the very end without stopping as if there is yeah. a real audience in front of you that's what we mean by rehearsing and only if you do that several times will you get to a point where you've internalized your message you don't have to memorize it yeah but you do need to internalize yeah. your message you need to own your message and that's the best way to address resistance or public speaking anxiety or, or nerves yeah and i think also what for me it's like if it's particularly important or the talk or the session or, or whatever i'm doing um and i absolutely hate watching me on the screen but i'll record myself right and play it back and you're like oh that makes no sense at all yeah <laughs> it's, it's almost me talking it out i can't hear what i'm speaking almost sometimes so by watching it i can actually go oh yeah that wasn't right or that didn't work in that place or i'm going to move it um but actually also one because you've got uh, a fantastic book um uh, which I've completely a uh, confident presenter, and uh, in it um, there's a, a bit where you say that you talk about that confidence is coming from a place uh, of feeling comfortable, which I thought was brilliant because it's kind of that all that thing that practicing getting comfortable with the talk, getting comfortable with if you've got slides, the slides, being comfortable with you know practicing at that numbers of people that you're presenting to and then getting bigger and bigger and bigger and i think you've got an example in your book of was it queen or something like that and yeah can you just talk about that because i thought that was brilliant yeah queen in 19 something one of the very first gigs when they were not as famous as as they then became they played in front in the uk in front of just six people now, can you imagine the Queen, <laughs> Freddie Mercury, play, playing in front of just six people? Now, when we think of Queen, Freddie Mercury, we think of Wembley Stadium. But before you yeah. get to Wembley Stadium, you play in front of six people. And, and the same is true when it comes to presenting, which is connected to what we said earlier, mm -hmm. like anxiety, resistant nerves. We don't have to start. Like you, you run an amazing event uh, for for the for the salesforce community every yeah, year yeah. with lots of people but we don't have to present in front of thousands hundreds of people or thousands of people we can start hmm. one to one or one to five just in front of five people 10 people 20 people and then and then confidence comes from one of the ways where confidence comes from is familiarity and preparation the more you do something the more confident you become at doing those things some time ago francis i watched a video of kobe bryant one of the the best nba players of all time and he was answering a few questions one of the questions was kobe how is it possible that every time i see you playing you always look so confident and he said i loved his response he said the only reason the only reason why you think i'm confident when you see me playing is because when you see me doing certain things, I've done those things a thousand times before. And he said, yeah. confidence comes from preparation. So Freddie Mercury was Freddie Mercury, of course, but one of the reasons why he looked so, and maybe he was an exception, but in general, let, let's say that he wasn't Freddie mm. Mercury. One of the reasons why he looked so confident in front of 70,000 people, 100,000 people at Wembley is because he went through the years and years of preparation in front of six people. Yeah. And the same can be applied to <laughs> presenting and public speaking and communication in general. Because, by the way, that's the yeah. context that we often have. We are talking about maybe a meeting with colleagues or with your with other stakeholders, with your leadership team, you've got five people in front of you. So we we don't have to necessarily think about public speaking as giving a TED talk or giving a big talk at a big conference. Yeah. And I think also um, just bring it back to kind of like the Salesforce world, there's all these kind of community groups, user groups, basically all over the world. And I remember when I started, um, I used to do the Mo Francis's five minute feature, which was literally standing up in front of a group of people and just talking about a feature on the platform for five minutes. And that was it. Um, and again, it's short, it's small, it's got to be to the point. It was all that, st you know, even create a small talk, I think is a lot harder than a longer one in, in some yeah. respects. But also it was 
you know, a small group of people, you know, if after five minutes it was a complete disaster, it didn't matter. It was in a forgiving environment. Um, and so, yeah, I'd recommend it if you are thinking of, of getting started and, and practicing or, you know, you practice in private, but then also just reach out to the community groups because they're always un- after, you know, content and just say, hey, look, can I just do a five minute presentation on this new feature on the platform that maybe nobody's heard of before uh, just to start Francis, going. practice is the most important thing because we are talking about a skill that requires knowledge and technique. These two things, knowledge and technique. It's a bit like learning how to play a new musical instrument, thinking about Wembley and, and Queen. So you need knowledge and technique. And when you've got this combination, what really makes a difference is practice. So any, you're right, any opportunity you have to put certain skills, certain principles into practice is gold. Uh, I'll give you another quick example. For the Ideas on Stage podcast, I interviewed some time ago Alexandra Galvez, who is well known on LinkedIn. She's got a, um, she's famous for a, a, a hashtag which is Authentic Alex. She talks about authenticity on LinkedIn. And she told me that now she's a public speaker. At the beginning of it, of her career, she hated, she hated public speaking. And at some point she had, she got two job offers for leadership positions, but one role did not involve public speaking, the other one did. And even if she hated public speaking, she chose the job, the role that involved public speaking because she understands that sometimes we just need to do it anyway. It's not about overcoming anxiety or fears or is it, it will that will never happen. But yeah. if we make a conscious decision to practice to do it anyway, despite whatever it is that we feel, then we w- with time and with practice we will get to a point where. It's going to be much easier for us to to control our feelings around all things public speaking. Yeah. So, <clears throat> if you could give would if you could give one piece of advice that people could go away right now to help improve their presentation skills, what would it be? Would it be to practice, or would it be practice something else? Is definitely one thing, but the, the the most important principle in in communication is make it about the audience. Think about the audience. Whatever it is that you want to communicate, it has to be relevant to the audience. This is the number one principle in communication. Mm. The the secret to great presenting is to always talk to your audience about them, even if you're talking about you. So rather Mm. than talking at your audience, about you, you want to talk to your audience about them, even if you're talking about you. I'll give you a very quick example. If you say, we have 158 offices all over the world, then you are talking at your audience about you, about the fact that you have so many offices all over the world and nobody cares. But if you say we have 158 offices all over the world so that you can get access to a customer support team wherever you are, now you are talking to your audience about them, even if actually you're talking about you. It's just a just a quick example. But the most important thing is when you communicate, it's not when you give a presentation, for example, think of a presentation as a present. If I want to give you a present, Francis, it's your present, not mine. Yeah. So I need to make sure that I know yeah. you so that I can buy something that you like. A presentation is the same thing. It's their presentation or yours. It's always the audience's presentation. So connected to this, and then I'll close here. Before opening up PowerPoint, before even thinking about what you want to communicate, the very first step you need to take in preparation for any presentation is to start with the audience. Take some time and ask yourself some questions about the audience, their needs, the context that allows you to then create something. It could be a presentation, it could be a talk, it could be communication in general, but something which is relevant to them. And that's the most important piece of advice I have to give. 
So um, I think we're you know, coming near to the end um, of the podcast. I just wonder if there's anything else that you think could help the listeners becoming a better presenter or any kind of information or any content you could kind of suggest that people kind of con- read or find out about you more um, that could be Thank helpful. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, definitely. One thing would be the book, uh, which is available on Amazon, mm-hmm. Confident Presenter. And then uh, if for those who want to make the most of the book, they can also take the Confident Presenter Scorecard. You can Google it, Confident Presenter Scorecard, that allows you to assess your current presentation skills in less than three minutes for free against the principles that I cover in the book. And the, the link is the name of a company, ideasonstage.com slash score. Like if you score a goal, S-C-O-E-R, so, sorry, S-C-O-R-E, score, like when you score a goal. And yeah, and I did it yesterday and it was really insightful actually on different aspects of presentation and the actual like, oh yeah, I don't actually do that. <laughs> or, you know, so yeah, no, it's really good and well, well worth yeah, checking and, out. Uh, that's it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. And, and sorry, and this is the final question I asked everybody on the podcast, which is if you could wind back time to a point in time in your past to give yourself some advice what advice would it be and at what point in time would it have been okay so it's something which is not connected to what we talked about today no, yeah i would go back to my early 20s because what happened in my early 20s i i started working for for someone else i was employed and i did that for about what was it 5 7 years and then I, I then I started my own business. And what I've learned in one year, just one year of running my business, was 10 times more and more useful than the, the previous seven years combined. Or I could also make the case that what I've learned in one day of running my business was was 10 times more useful than seven years combined. So and this is not, it's just something for me. I'm not saying that this is what people have to do. But for me, if I were to go back, I would start my own business in my early 20s rather than mm. following the path I, I followed at that time. Okay, interesting. And actually, I do have one final question. And that was... Um, what do you see in the kind of trends of in the realm of kind of presentations and public speaking in, you know, especially this world where we're going more digital, more virtual, more online content? Uh, just, you know, some advice around that, I think. And that's because, you know, quite interesting. When it comes to digital online content, then your ability to 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 simplify your message to keep it brief keep it short becomes even more important but there's one thing in particular that we hear all the time at the moment which is connected to what you asked which is the, the role of technology in general uh, will yeah. technology will ai for example artificial intelligence change public speaking forever and mm. The trend I see, and I, I don't have a crystal ball, Francis, I don't know, but the trend I see... And, and <laughs> I don't think anyone has. <laughs> I, I, I think that no. Uh, uh, for example, artificial intelligence is not going to change public speaking forever, and here is why. Jeff Bezos often says that he's often asked, what do you think is going to change in the next 10 years? And he says, nobody ever asked me, what do you think is not going to change in the next 10 years mm. and he thinks that the second question is much more useful because if you focus on the things that don't change that's what he says you will be successful in the case of amazon for example they know that 10 years from now people will still want low prices fast delivery and a big selection <laughs> yeah. so they know that if they focus on those, those things they will be successful in the future when it comes to communication presenting it's the same thing. There are things that change and things that don't change. The things that change mm. are tools and technology. 50 years ago, Francis, we didn't have PowerPoint. A few years ago, we didn't have yeah. Riverside that we are using today to record this, this yeah. episode. A few months ago, we didn't have ChatGPT. These are things that will change. That's inevitable. 
But then there are things that don't change. And these are the fundamental principles of communication. And so we should focus on those things. Aristotle, and then I'll close here. Aristotle was the first one more than 2000 years ago who gave us the building blocks of persuasion, influencing, effective communication. And he didn't have access to the technology we have access to today. So for example, in your case, Francis, you, you run your annual event, you give presentations, you give talks at conferences. Think about 10 years from now, you give a talk and at a conference, and then somebody comes to you and they say, Francis, that was a great presentation. I just wish that your message was not so simple for me to understand. That will never happen. Or I just <laughs> wish that your presentation was not so clear for me to follow and remember, or that it wasn't so original and enjoyable. Or Francis, great talk. I just wish that your message was not so relevant to me and my needs. That will never happen. And it will never happen because these are the fundamental principles of communication. Of course, you do want to pay attention to what's going on with technology. I do that because if we use it well, technology can help us get a message across in an even more effective way. But what really makes a difference and what differentiates average communicators from great communicators is whether or not they know and they know how to apply the fundamental principles of communication. So focus on the things that don't change. Brilliant. I think that's what a brilliant way to end the podcast. Well, thank you so much, uh, Andrea, for being on the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed yourself and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thanks for watching or listening to the Salesforce Posse podcast. Now, please, 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 if you like or what you see or hear, then please rate this podcast in your podcast player as it tells me that there are people out there that actually are listening to this and that it's useful to them. Also, it helps the podcast algorithms to kind of elevate the podcast in the different podcast directories, which will be really helpful for me as well. And Finally, if you do have a question that you want to ask on the podcast, then head to salesforceposse.com slash message and maybe you'll appear in the next podcast. But apart from that, thanks for listening and until next time, ta-ta!